scorned your blessing, chose the grave. Our hands and feet were bound in chains until you came. Good morning, Compass Point. My name's Alex Burke. I'm the guy that makes all these uh, pre-recorded services for you guys to watch on Sunday. Um, just wanted to stop by, say hello. Um, just encourage you to uh, say good morning in the comments section right next to me. Beneath this video, there's some links to some very important videos, like uh, the ones about reopening. If you're interested in, our in uh, attending our in-person services, I highly encourage you to go watch those. As well as there are links to the podcast that Paul and Dave do every single week following another series of Matthew. I highly encourage everyone to watch the Digital Hub this week. Rachel is hosting and uh, we all love Rachel. So uh, just after this service, just go swing on over there and uh, join the conversation. This week's episode of the podcast is about our in-person services. So if you want to learn more about that, that's a great uh, resource for you to listen to. Well, that's all for me. I hope you all have a great service. See you, everyone. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out i turn back to praise when the darkness closes in lord still i will say blessed be Blessed be your name, oh. oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, oh, blessed be your glorious name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, 
Blessed be your glorious name. Hey, kids! How are you creative? Do some of you like to paint like me? Or maybe you sing? Or play an instrument? Those are all creative things. But creativity can be sneaky sometimes too. It can show up in a whole lot of different places. Like on the soccer field, when you have to come up with a unique plan to get the ball down the field. Or when you're baking and you have to come up with a way to make your cupcake look more appetizing. Or when you are in an argument with your brother about who gets to choose the next show. You have to creatively come up with a solution. Creativity is everywhere. Do you know why you are creative though? Because God made you to be creative. He used his creativity to make this whole entire universe. And he made you to be like him because he wanted you to be able to dream and create things too. Well, what creative things could you get up to this week? Oh, try this. If you could make the most creative, epically amazing bedroom you have ever seen, what would it look like? What would be in it? What would have to be in it? Draw it, paint it, write about it, or build it out of Lego. Whatever it is, just let your creativity run wild. Have a good week, guys. Hi, my name is John Fauteux, and uh, I am the bass player in the worship band. I get to play up there once a month. Fun fact, I am one of 12 children, so I have 11 brothers and sisters scattered across Canada and the USA. Um, so in 2014, I had early onset cataracts, had cataract surgery in both eyes, and on the right eye, the, the surgeon made a mistake, and I lost all vision in my right eye back in 2009. Uh, 2014, then I had a detachment on my left retina um, and was surgically corrected and I got my vision back. I got my driver's license back and, and I thought things were great. Towards the end of 2015 though I noticed my vision in my left eye started to deteriorate. So on New Year's Eve of 2015 I had a surgery called a retinal peel where they removed the scar off of my retina but all of the retinal material underneath was irreparably damaged and so that left me with really poor vision so that has had a huge impact on how I live my life I can't really function in a grocery store or anything like that I certainly can't drive the hardest part for me is not being able to recognize any faces, to see facial expressions, to know who I am in the room with unless they identify themselves. This is an identification cane. It doesn't really help me get around because I can see large objects, but what it does do is tells other people, hey, this guy carrying this thing is visually impaired. So I'm legally blind, but I, I prefer the term visually impaired because I can see things. So uh, I'm continuing on the health journey, boy. But in 2017, I had sepsis. Basically, basically, your body, all your organs are starting to shut down. So I was in the hospital for about 11 days until my kidney function uh, returned to normal. October, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And it's, uh, you know, cancer is not fun. <laughs> I'm pretty sure most people are aware of that. Uh, but the, the good news is it was very, just an isolated tumor which was removed, uh, but then I needed six months of chemotherapy which I've just, just finished. I, I thought when I had the sepsis that I could never feel worse. And so I was kind of, had a lot of bravado going into the chemotherapy, it's like, oh no, I've experienced this vision loss, I've experienced the, the sepsis. 
chemotherapy. What? It's going to be a picnic. Well, it was not a picnic. It was it was very challenging. There was days where you just felt like you your blood was just leaving your body and you had no energy to lift your head. But you just don't know how you're going to get through each day. You just don't know, you know, why, how am I going to manage? Where, when is tomorrow going to come so that I'll feel better? And, you know, here it is. I feel great now. It was pretty horrible, but to be honest, I had a great peace. God just filled my heart and said, hey, this isn't where it ends for you. Don't worry about it. We'll get you through this. And then when I was suffering, it wasn't about understanding Bible verses. It was about feeling the presence of God to help get you through that moment. So the, one of the lessons that I learned through all of these um, negative things that uh, you know that have happened to me basically is that I had to learn to humble myself. I had to learn that I can't do everything for myself and I have to learn how to ask for things. I need to get rides. It was really a, a shift. But then when, when I started asking people, and, and most of the time they were very willing to help, which was really developed some closer bonds. And it actually gave other people the opportunity to, to serve the community. I know that sounds weird. I'm not used to being on the receiving end of service. I'm the guy who wants to help other people, but now I, I can't in the way that, in the same way that I used to. I can't offer someone a ride somewhere. I, I can't, you know, it would be really challenging for me to go and work in a soup kitchen because I'd be pretty useless there. Um, so now I'm the recipient and that gives other people the, the, the opportunity to serve. And it's humbling, but also it's it's a learning process to say, "Hey, man, you you, you now have limits that you know you got to live with, and give some give some other people the opportunity to help you." Mm -hmm. Good morning, Compass Point. We're going to continue to worship and to sing with a song called Cut Through the Noise. And this is a song I wrote years ago uh, as a reminder to myself to ask God to help me be less distracted in worship. Um, and I think that's a pretty easy thing, especially right now. You know, many of us are at home. Um, we're maybe a little more comfortable. Maybe at first we thought digital church would be hard, but now that we realize we can, you know, roll out of bed a little later and, and uh, things are a little easier, maybe it's not so bad. And yet there's still these distractions. And I don't think distractions are unique to this, right? I mean, sometimes we're at church and something catches our eye or, or someone starts talking to us or we get a ding on our phone, right? Distractions are everywhere. And I think they're going to be part of our worship experience until the fullness of God's kingdom comes. But I do think it is good for us to try to remove distractions, to try to focus our hearts and our minds on who God is and what he's done and why that is absolutely central in our lives. So why don't we sing this song together? Cut through the noise. Cut through the noise that wanders into my life. Give me the mind to ponder the depth of your love. Remind me of what it cost you to bury my shame. Show me the spirit moving in my heart again. God be praised. Hallelujah. Amazing grace has come to save.
Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord. for who you are, your character, your goodness, your love. We praise you for what you've done, the beauty of your creation, sending Jesus to this earth to walk amongst us, offering forgiveness and reconciliation through him. We praise you for the blessings you've given us, the blessing of living in Canada, the, the blessing of being able to worship openly and freely, the, the, the blessing of being able to gather in church community, whether we be gathering in person or online this morning. Lord Jesus, we remember those who are suffering this morning. We remember those who've been affected by the explosion in Beirut. We uh, remember those who've been afflicted by COVID-19, by cancer, by other health issues. We remember those who are struggling with uncertainty around jobs or impending medical diagnoses or around their own independence. We remember those this morning who have suffered loss and are grieving. Father, for each one of these, would you bring your presence and your peace and your healing? May they experience your uh, goodness and your provision and your love even in the midst of hardship and trial. Holy Spirit, would you empower us to be citizens of the kingdom? Would you empower us to be hearers and doers of the word? Would you make our hearts and lives fertile soil for your gospel, that it might uh, take root, that it might grow, that it might flourish in our lives? Father God, may we be uh, tellers of your story, conveyors of your truth, tellers of your kingdom ways. Father God, help us to be uh, good, faithful citizens in your kingdom. Help us to be those who are submitted to the king, who are uh, advancing the ways of the king, who are furthering the mission of our King. And we pray all these things in the name of that King, Jesus. And we pray as he prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 
Well, uh, good morning again, Compass Point. Uh, I am obviously not at home today, uh, as you can see. And as a church, we've started our in-person services. And so right now, at the same time, there are some who are meeting together again back at the church. Now, we understand this isn't for everyone, but if you are feeling like you are ready to take this step, then you're going to need to register for next week. Um, as we move along, you'll see more and more information about what these services look like. Uh, on our website, you can find frequently asked questions, you can find more information. So please, you know, if, check that out if this is uh, of interest to you. Now, while we are still offering our in-person services, we are equally excited for those of you who have chosen to join us online. So welcome to all of you and thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you so much. It has already been a great morning. It's great to hear John's story and I'm so thankful for people like him. Um, you know, people who can be used as such an encouragement to all of us, to our whole church family. And, uh, and today we're celebrating with him, which is, uh, which is great. And so thanks again uh, for sharing. So we're continuing our series today in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them up, uh, turn them on. Uh, we titled this series Kingdom Come uh, because Jesus talked about the kingdom more than anything else. And specifically in Matthew, what we have been seeing as we've been reading through this is a, a picture of the kingdom and a portrait of the king. And maybe this kingdom language is a bit strange for us living in 2020, but it's helpful when we think of the way that Jesus leads in our lives. He's established a way of living, and whatever you might believe about God, today I believe that you will find as the more we align ourselves with the way of Jesus— the more we find things uh, like peace and joy, uh, regardless of our circumstances, uh, regardless of what's happening around us. So as Jesus continued to teach, he was proclaiming the kingdom, as we talked about before, in other words, telling people about it, and he was demonstrating the kingdom by, um, by fixing brokenness and by healing sickness. And, 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 and what we saw is this, this all stemmed from a deep compassion for those who needed his help. And as Jesus was doing this, word spread. Uh, very early on, the religious leaders um, uh, heard about Jesus, and they heard about the ways that, that, that he was lining up with things that had been said about the Messiah um, you know, in Scripture, the Savior, of, for, for many, many years. And the religious uh, leaders were, you know, just like any other Jews, they were longing for the Jewish king to arrive and for the kingdom to take root. So when they heard about Jesus, they went to hear what he was teaching because they, they wanted to know something. They wanted to know if Jesus was conforming to the teachings that they knew. Was he, was he lining up with the tradition of the elders? I mean, this was the most important thing for them, and this is what they wanted to know as they came to see Jesus. If Jesus was who he uh, seemed to be claiming to be, then, then they expected that there would be alignment. And so this, is, this was the first bit of controversy in the kingdom. How do we know who actually is part of the kingdom and who has the inside track? And this all comes down to a question of authority. Who was the one who was able to create the boundaries for the kingdom? And Jesus had already faced some pushback from the religious leaders, but now it was intensifying. The religious leaders were interested in this kingdom, and, and so was Jesus. And so you, this conflict begins to, to arrive, and you start to see what's happening here. And it's going to continue through the next few chapters of Matthew. So right here in chapter 15, verse 1, what you see is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had been sent from Jerusalem. And the fact that Jerusalem is mentioned here means that this was the A-team. This was the, the best of the best, sent because maybe others were having a hard time sort of understanding who Jesus was and, and what he was teaching. And so they had to bring in the heavy hitters. And so here come these leaders or these teachers from Jerusalem. So I want to start reading, just jump right into uh, verse 1. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, open them up. We're going to read along um, starting in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. 
So what could be more applicable than a discussion around hand washing during a pandemic? But I don't need to remind you that this is not about hygiene. There was something bigger going on here. Um, the tradition of the elders was an agreed upon set of laws that were mostly oral at this point. They were interpretations of scripture that were, that were uh, from well-respected rabbis that later would be called what we know as the Mishnah uh, and eventually the Talmud. I mean, these were important writings and they still are. In some ways, they had become as significant or as important as the scriptures themselves. So what we've talked about in tradition before here at the church is, is that tradition can be helpful in its proper place. And I love the illustration of a glass uh, that helps us see through. You know, if traditions help us get a more clear picture of who Jesus is as we look through them, then they are worth, um, we, we should use them to help us in that way. But when they start to obscure our understanding of Jesus, when they start to make Jesus less clear, then it's clearly something that we need to be recognizing that they aren't helpful. Traditions are things to look through. So hand washing was one of these traditions that the elders had talked about. And the teachers of the law, you know, they were coming to see if Jesus was conforming to these, these, this, this teaching. And so they were watching this and they were like, okay, Ah, see, right there, right there, he's, he, he can't possibly be the Messiah. He broke the commands of the elders. And Jesus was obviously getting frustrated by this line of questioning. Listen, Jesus wasn't anti-hand washing by any means, but he knew what was happening. So look how he responded. You can see this in verse 3. We'll pick it up. It says, Jesus replied, and why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used for help for their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You see, Jesus was pointing out their hypocrisy. And he showed how the tradition was not perfect and it was not infallible. He uses the example that needs a little bit of explanation for modern readers. But in a nutshell, what he was saying was that uh, they knew that God's law told them that they needed to respect and honor their fa father and mother, which included financial support when they needed it most. But the tradition of the elders had passed on that, that money that could be declared for God, or if you stated that this money was de devoted or dedicated to God, then it didn't have to be used for that purpose in terms of supporting mom and dad. And so what was happening was that these, these laws or traditions that were passed on from the elders were actually obscuring the truth of the, of the, of the Bible. They were obscuring the truth of this, of this call to honor our fathers and our mothers. Listen, this is nothing new. Uh, sometimes God's law is replaced by understanding or teachings uh, that kind of get us off track. Sometimes it's intentional but I would suggest that most of the time it's unintentional. You know, we come to something that we don't like in the Bible and, and, and we rely on a particular interpretation to make what we're reading fit our worldview, where we want things to line up in a particular way. And so we look for an interpretation that fits that and then we say, that's the truth. But if we're not careful, what we're doing is allowing the, 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 the interpretation of certain individuals to begin to obscure the truth that we can find in the text. Relying completely on one person's opinion for, for shaping and guiding our lives might mean that we are moving away from God. I mean, relying on other interpretations is actually something that can be helpful to us. In fact, for me, as I looked into uh, this passage this morning, I read commentaries. But here's the thing, I read multiple commentaries. Because we get into trouble when we start to look to one idea or one voice to be the true voice and the one that we follow. 
Well, in this passage, since devoting um, money to God was used as an example, we can, we can extrapolate that what was going on here was probably a bit of a loophole. Probably what was happening was that, was that the teachers of the law were trying to create an understanding of the scriptures that would make things comfortable for those people. Because look again at what he says in verse 8. He says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So he was quoting here from Isaiah 29. And here's the point. When Jesus heard their line of questioning, he knew that the problem with the religious leaders was that they were more interested in what they looked like than they were in actually getting their hearts right. There's a few standard pieces of equipment that you uh, probably have in your cars right now that you didn't have a few months ago. Uh, First of all, it's masks. They are required to be worn indoors, and I guess that for you, many of us have masks lying around in different places so that we can use them when we need to. There's also people um, who, if you want to know who is kind of serious about looking after themselves and people that are around them, you'll look for the people that carry around those bottles of hand sanitizer, the little small ones. And probably uh, many of you are actually doing this and carrying these around. I know that there's lots of these in our cars and in different places in our home as well. But it's almost like a, it's almost like a badge of honor. You know, if you are nervous as a shop worker and someone comes in and after they, they purchase their, their item, they start to kind of use this hand sanitizer, you can, you can rest assured that these people are safe people. These people are people who are following the restrictions as best they possibly can. But is that true? Maybe. But just because someone plays the part of a responsible citizen doesn't make them one when it comes to the virus. I mean, who knows where they were the night before or who they were spending time with or whether they're developing symptoms. We just don't know the answer to those questions. But there are a lot of people who would call themselves Jesus followers who play the part, but whose insides just don't match up with what they want people to see. And I feel like this habit that we've been missing these days of actually attending church um, has traditionally been one of these... um, for lack of a better word, for for one of these covers. You know, we say, well, I'm a church person. I'm someone who goes to church, and so you know that I'm a devoted follower of Jesus. Well, for some of us, this pandemic has forced us to consider what living under the reign of king looks like when we don't have those traditional markers. Uh, Let me get a little bit uncomfortable here for a moment and try to make this clear. Because for some of us, When we take away our time at church, when we take away the meetings and volunteering, you know, the the stuff that isn't as available as it used to be, we find ourselves wondering, what is our faith actually all about? And here's what I want us to consider this morning. For Jesus, the kingdom is not simply about conforming our religious actions. The kingdom is about transforming our hearts from the inside. It was less about lip service or saying the right things. It was was less about doing the right thing when people are watching or checking off a list on some kind of good behavior uh, checklist. The kingdom is about hearts that are close to God. Transformation from the inside. (coughs) Excuse me. I always feel weird when I start to cough in times like these. It just kind of, everybody starts to freak out a little bit. But here's the thing. In quoting Isaiah, Jesus was saying that if you are more concerned with the way that you look on the outside, then your worship might just mean very little. And that's hard to hear because all the passionate public singing or reading or rule following, including hand washing in front of others, might actually be impressing some people, but it's not going to make a difference in our relationship with God. You see, this is the hallmark of the new kingdom. It's about transformation. And this is important for us to hear. I mean, don't get me wrong, our actions do matter, but only as a byproduct of what's happening inside, that change that's happening in our hearts. Look at what he says next in verse 10. Jesus turned to the crowd 
And he said to them, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. Jesus brings the, con- uh, the, the conversation back to this, um, uh, back to the ceremonial washing that started everything in the first place. And his disciples said, hey, you know, if you skip down to verse 16, they said, can you explain what you mean by that sentence? Because that is a little bit confusing. And Jesus goes on to identify what he meant. And he says, are you still so dull? Jesus asked them, don't you see that whatever enters uh, the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. For out of the hearts come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. You see, it's a heart issue. What comes out of us is a better indication of the condition of our hearts than what we put on. Well, as you can imagine, things got pretty heated after this exchange. Uh, you can see there in verse 12 that, and, and from then on, that the, the, there seems to be this opposition against the kingdom that begins to grow. Uh, Jesus called them blind guides and suggested they'd be uprooted like weeds when it really mattered. And notice when Jesus was alive, the strongest threat to the kingdom seemed to be the religious people. And this should be a warning to the church today. This is like a a neon blinking sign that reminds us that, listen, I can obscure the kingdom in my life when I play church without having a heart that's changed. You know, when we conform to a list of do's and don'ts publicly without transformed hearts, we are getting ourselves into trouble. Because for Jesus, the kingdom was not simply about conforming our religious actions. The kingdom is about transforming our very hearts. So how do we do that? Well, see, Jesus points out the problem, and he actually warns people not to allow tradition to take first place. He warns them that religiosity or what a person appears to be doing, you know, when they're living from the outside is not a guarantee that we are living under the reign of the King Jesus, of King Jesus in our lives. Uh, he, doesn't, he points those things out, but he doesn't let us know how to get to the solution. He doesn't make that specifically clear. We know it's about our hearts, We know it's about our hearts, which is not just a muscle, but it's our motivations and it's our desires. And so it's how we think on the inside. So how do we keep our hearts uh, focused? How do we keep an eye on our hearts? How do we keep track? Well, Jeremiah um, 17, verse 9, the prophet lets us in on a little secret that might be hard to hear. In fact, you might not even agree with this. It's an unpopular idea, but I believe that if we pause for just a moment, we might actually be able to see it in other people, and more importantly, we can probably see it in ourselves as well. It's tough to hear. Here's what he says, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is, a deceit, is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure, who can understand it? The heart is broken. It's without hope. We can't fix our own hearts. Money can't buy us a better heart. Uh, Being good people can't clean up our hearts. So the conflict begins to grow in the kingdom that Jesus was proclaiming. And this, this conflict was not simply about Jesus versus the Pharisees. It was a battle over authority in the kingdom. And the question is, who rules our hearts? He said, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And listen, this sounds theoretical. I get that. It sounds abstract. I mean, what do you mean our hearts are broken? I mean, how do we know if Jesus is actually ruling our lives? If there's a battle for authority in my life, what what does that actually look like? Well, let me point out a couple of ways that I think that we can find our hearts far from God, and even when we claim to be followers of Jesus. The first one is obvious. Whatever things might look like on the outside, when we choose not to follow Jesus as king in our, uh, as king in our lives, our hearts may be far from him. This one is obvious. I mean, 
there are some people who are purposefully manipulative. These are people who are literally living double lives, putting on religion like a pair of shorts for the weekend, but then uh, living their life in, in completely different ways, lying and cheating in business, or, or, or um, knowingly choose to do wrong things. All the things that are listed, actually, you can see there in verse 19. You know, I suspect for many that, that this may not describe you. Uh, most of us want to make good choices in our life. I get that, which leads to the second potential problem with our hearts. Whatever we assume about ourselves, when we stop paying attention to our hearts, we may find ourselves far from him. If we believe that our hearts are easily corrupted, then they, it needs our attention. We need to be paying attention to our hearts. And this one, I think, is really important for us to consider because we may be able to find ourselves in this place. And it's far more dangerous in some ways because we may not even recognize it. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, the recent events that are related to race in the U.S. have started conversations that are really important for us to have. Feelings of privilege and prejudice go straight into our hearts, often without even knowing. And if we don't pay attention, a belief that somehow that we are better than other people begins to creep in and it affects us deeply in our lives. See, the thing is that good people flinch when they see someone from a different background or someone who is poor or disadvantaged and our hearts get filled up sometimes with suspicion or hatred or rejection or fear and it may even surprise us, but our hearts might be promoting the agenda of the enemy. Listen, we need to pay attention to our hearts. The Pharisees felt superior because of their cleaned up religious lives. The church people were a threat to the kingdom because they were allowing what they believed about themselves to be the most important. They were relying on checklists and, and, and they started what started as a desire to truly understand and follow God became a dangerous feeling of self-sufficiency and self-importance. And Jesus said, ignore them because their hearts are far away. Instead, pay attention to your own heart. It's not surprising that conflict began to emerge from such an early time. You know, I think we also need to recognize another potential problem when it comes to our hearts. When we experience pain in our lives, our hearts can drift from God. You know, often in a bad relationship where someone ends up getting hurt, you hear a person say, well, I will never, I, I'm never going to let someone hurt me like that again. And we can go into self-protection mode, and it's completely uh, understandable, but what we also know is that these promises that we make to ourselves can impact relationships going forward, can't they? You know, we close our hearts off from some experiences, and ultimately we lose out. And this happens in relation to the way that we experience God. If we're not careful, we can portion off parts of our hearts and give God most of our devotions, but then we hold other parts back because we don't want to be hurt again. What we perceive to be unanswered prayer works that way. You know, if God didn't, if God didn't stop the cancer, if he didn't stop the violence, if he didn't restore that relationship, then I'm just not going to go there anymore because I, I can't handle the pain and the tendency is that we begin to drift. Listen, I understand this might feel a little dark and a little hopeless. Hearts are wicked. We easily slip away um, from, king, from Jesus as king. So, so how do we do this? What do we do? How do we, how do we keep our hearts centered? You see, the most basic conflict in the kingdom is the same today as it was when it began. It's a conflict based on authority. What is most important to you? And, and where do those thoughts and feelings come from? Jesus said very clearly, I am king. Don't follow human traditions. Don't be fooled by a, self, a, self, a sense of self-importance. Being part of the kingdom is not simply about conforming to religious checklists that make us feel good about ourselves. Being part of the kingdom is about transforming our hearts. And perhaps you're a bit unclear as to how we transform our hearts. Well, the answer is we don't. Remember the whole we can't fix our hearts uh, in any way, in the same way, we aren't the final authority in the kingdom. 
Now, a prophet named Ezekiel told the people of God the plan well before Jesus. In Ezekiel 36, uh, verses 26 and 27, here's what God said through the prophet. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart, uh, I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Listen, removing our hard hearts and replacing them is God's job. And this is at the foundation of the kingdom. It's not simply about conforming to a set of standards or memorizing facts. It's about our need for heart transformation. And this is where the Pharisees got it so wrong. And if we're honest, this is where we need to be paying attention to. Because what we see is not always what we get, is it? You know, the really good news of the gospel is that Jesus came to give us new life in the kingdom. A kingdom that is only partially realized today. A kingdom where we need to constantly realign ourselves and remind ourselves of whose authority we are ultimately submitting to. And part of the great news is that we're not alone. Part of the great news is that the Holy Spirit is given to convict us, to guide us, to lead us. We're not alone in the fight. And that's great news. So what's our role? It's actually really simple. Repentance. Simply repentance. Jesus was talking about the religious leaders um, when he described them, but the rebuke was not just for them. And if we sit at the, on this side of history and look back at them and say, oh, well, those Pharisees, look at them, they were being so hypocritical, then we put ourselves in a spot of arrogance that's not any better than where they were. The truth is, this is something that you and I need to hear as well. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Well, as we close, I want for us to spend some time reflecting on this in a bit of a prayer exercise. So I'm going to ask you, uh, wherever you are, just to, to close your eyes and let's pray together. As we begin, I want you to take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the condition of your heart. Just take a moment. Perhaps this morning, as we've been sharing, you've recognized some places where you have willfully gone in a direction that you know is not allowing Jesus to be the king in your life. Just in the next few moments, confess those times to him. Perhaps you've allowed some biases or misunderstanding to lead your thinking in ways that you might not even immediately recognize. Maybe some places in your heart that surprise you at times. Would you just take a few moments to confess those to him? Perhaps this morning you are recognizing that there are hurts in your life that have caused you to shut Jesus out of some of the places in your life. You take a moment to confess those as well. This morning, Jesus, God, we, we just ask for forgiveness for the ways in which we've replaced you as king in our lives. Intentionally and unintentionally, God, we recognize that our hearts are hopeless without you. God, we ask that by your spirit, you renew our hearts right now. Even in these moments, God, help us to put you on the throne of our lives. Help you, God, help us to reflect the kingdom as it should be. God, you are the authority needed in our lives to keep us from putting our own desires and our thoughts and motivations in your place. God, help us to put you first. Help us to remove those things that we believe that we've put on the throne and put you in your proper place. God, we thank you and we praise you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 
Well, thank you for uh, going through that with us as we've been walking through this book of Matthew. And as we close, I want to remind you that if you would like someone to pray for you right now, uh, we are ready and waiting to do that. Uh, just give us your information uh, to, to uh, prayer at compasspointbc.com and we will have someone uh, contact you right away and pray with you. Uh, also today, if you want to take the current conversation further, uh, certainly you're welcome to join us in the hub. And, uh, and Rachel Collins is going to be joining us uh, in the hub today. And uh, we're really looking forward to that as well. So thank you so much for being here today. God bless. Uh, until we see each other in person, uh, we will see you again next week online right here. Uh, God bless. Have an absolutely fantastic week. The grip of death could never hold you. You crushed the curse. New life is in you. We stand amazed. Your body raised. The grip of death could never hold you. Good morning. I have been expecting.